Hello, this is video lecture number 67. Today we are talking about reform reshaped from the years 1901 to 1917. For our subsections today, we've got Theodore Roosevelt in the White House, grassroots progressive movements, Taft and the election of 1912, Wilson and the New Freedom, and finally progressive legacies. So this video is going to be longer than what we're used to and we have a lot of information to cover. So we're just going to jump right in right now without doing our typical introduction that you're used to. So let's go ahead and look at our first subsection, um, again, which is Theodore Roosevelt in the White House. So in 1900, William McKinley easily won his second political faceoff against Democrat William Jennings Bryan. Only six months into his second term, however, on September 14, 1901, the president was shot as he attended a fair in Buffalo, New York. He died eight days later. In an effort to neutralize the rising star Theodore Roosevelt, Republican bosses chose him as McKinley's running mate in 1900, hoping the vice presidency would be a political dead end. Instead, they subtly found Roosevelt in the White House. Roosevelt did not prove to be, however, quite the rebel that his critics feared. He was, after all, a Republican who had denounced the extreme views of populists, and he blended reform with the needs of private enterprise. Roosevelt won fame as an environmentalist, for example, uh, but many of his conservation policies had a strong pro-business bent. He increased the amount of lands held in federal forest reserves and turned their management over to a new independent U.S. Forest Service. But Roosevelt's forestry chief, uh, Gifford Pinchot, insisted on fire suppression to maximize logging potential. In addition, Roosevelt lent his support to the Newlands Reclamation Act, 1902, which had much in common with earlier Republican policies to promote economic development in the West. Under the Newlands Act, the federal government sold public lands to raise money for irrigation projects that expanded agriculture on arid lands. Despite his generally supportive attitude toward business, Roosevelt undertook some marked departures from his predecessors. During a bitter 1902 coal strike, he threatened to neutralize the big coal companies uh, by nationalizing them uh, if their owners refused to negotiate with the miners' union. The owners hastily came to the table. Roosevelt also sought better enforcement of the Interstate Commerce Act and the Sherman Antitrust Act. In 1903, he pushed through the Elkins Act, which prohibited discriminatory railway rates that favored powerful customers. That same year, he created a Bureau of Corporations, empowered to investigate business practices and bolster the Justice Department's capacity to mount antitrust suits. Theodore Roosevelt was a man of contradictions, uh, whose presidency left a mixed legacy. An unabashed believer in what he called the Anglo-Saxon superiority, Roosevelt nonetheless invited Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House, earning fierce denunciation from white supremacists. Similarly, Roosevelt was an advocate of elite rule, who called for the best men to enter politics. But he also defended the dignity of labor. Later in his public career, Roosevelt read and recommended works by European socialists. This complex mix of condescension and social justice activism was characteristic of many elite and middle class progressives. All right, on to the next section then, grassroots progressive movements. In part, Roosevelt provided reform leadership because he faced increasing pressure for government action. At the grassroots, Agrarians and labor leaders continued to demand stronger remedies for dangerous working conditions, low pay, and concentrated corporate power. Building on earlier movements such as civil service reform and the anti-liquor cause, uh, elite and middle class progressives were also mobilizing for change. As they had since the 1880s, women played prominent roles in reform. Justifying their work through maternal, maternalism, uh, the claim that women should, should expand their motherly role in the public sphere, uh, they focused especially on the welfare of working class women and children. Progressives were partly inspired by the emerging fields of social work and social science. Social scientists, uh, sociologists, 
focused special attention on the plight of urban poor. Uh, they argued that unemployment and crowded slums were not caused by individual laziness and ignorance, uh, as elite Americans had long believed. By 1899, the National Consumers League was founded. Uh, five years later, the group had grown to 64 leagues in 20 states. At its head stood the outspoken Florence Kelly, a Hull House worker, and for a brief time, Chief Factory Inspector of Illinois. Kelly believed only government oversight could protect exploited workers. Uh, under her crusading leadership, the Consumers League became a powerful advocate for protective legislation. One of the League's greatest triumphs was the Supreme Court's decision in Mueller v. Oregon from 1908, which upheld an Oregon law limiting women's workdays to 10 hours. In the wake of the Plessy decision and Southern disfranchisement, African American leaders grappled with a distinct set of political challenges. Faced with the obvious uh, deterioration of African American rights, a new generation of African American leaders challenged the leadership of Tuskegee educator Booker T. Washington. Harvard educated sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois called for a talented tenth of educated blacks to develop new strategies. Ida Wells Barnett, a journalist who undertook a one-woman crusade against lynching, joined the call for new ideas. In 1905, Du Bois and Trotter called a meeting at Niagara Falls on the Canadian side because no hotel in the U.S. side would admit blacks. The resulting Niagara movement had a broad impact. The group's Niagara principles call for full voting rights, the end of segregation, equal treatment in the justice system, and equal opportunity in education, jobs, health care, and military service. These principles, based on black pride and an uncompromising demand for full equality, guided the civil rights movement throughout the 20th century. Now, not long after the Niagara Conference, a shocking atrocity brought public attention to the civil rights cause. In 1908, a bloody race riot broke out in Springfield, Illinois, hometown of Abraham Lincoln. Appalled by the violence against blacks, New York settlement worker Mary White Ovington uh, called together a group of sympathetic progressives. Their meeting led in 1909 to the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Most leaders of the Niagara movement soon joined, and W.E.B. Du Bois became editor of the NAACP journal called The Crisis. The fledgling NAACP found allies in black churches and the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. It also cooperated with the National Urban League, 1911, a union of agencies that assisted black migrants in the North. Over the coming decades, these groups grew into a powerful force for racial justice. Now, as reform emerged at the grassroots, some states served as important seedbeds of reform. Teddy Roosevelt dubbed Wisconsin a laboratory of democracy under energetic Republican Governor Robert La Follette. La Follette promised what he called uh, the Wisconsin idea, greater government intervention in the economy. To promote this goal, he relied heavily on experts at the University of Wisconsin particularly economists, for uh, policy recommendations. La Follette combined respect for experts with a strong commitment to democracy. He won battles to restrict lobbying and give Wisconsin citizens the right of recall, which is voting to remove unpopular politicians from office, and referendum, voting directly on a proposed policy measure rather than leaving it in the hands of elected legislators. Going on to a long career in the U.S. US Senate, La Follette, like Roosevelt, advocated increasingly aggressive measures to protect workers and rein in corporate power. Labor reforms also advanced steadily through state initiatives, most notably workmen's compensation laws. Uh, the U.S. industrial workplace was incredibly dangerous. Coal miners, for example, died from cave-ins and explosions at a rate 50% higher than in German mines. Between 1910 and 17, all the industrial states enacted insurance laws covering on-the-job accidents so that workers' families would not starve if a breadwinner was injured or killed. Now, the failure to pass labor laws reflected Republican political dominance and also unions' reluctance to engage in politics. Leaders of the nation's dominant union, uh, the American Federation of Labor, uh, had long preached that workers should improve wages 
uh, and working conditions through self-help. Voluntarism, as trade unions call this doctrine, centered on strikes and direct negotiations with employers, not political action. But voluntarism began to weaken by the 1910s, as muckraking journalists exposed the plight of workers and progressive reformers came forward with solutions, organized labor leaders in state after state began to join that cause. At the same time, the nation confronted a daring wave of militancy from more radical labor groups. In 1905, the Western Federation of Miners, led by fiery leaders like Big Bill Haywood, uh, joined with other radicals to create a new movement called the Industrial Workers of the World. The Wobblies, as the IWW were called, were fervent supporters of the Marxist class struggle. Uh, as uh, syndicalists, they believed that by resisting in the workplace and ultimately launching a general strike, workers could eventually overthrow capitalism. All right, let's move on to Taft then and the election of 1912. Taft's Democratic opponent in 1908 was William Jennings Bryan. Uh, eloquent as ever, Bryan attacked Republicans as the party of plutocrats, men who used their wealth to buy political influence. He outdid Taft in urging tougher antitrust and pro-labor legislation, but Taft won comfortably. In the wake of Taft's victory, reform politics began to divide Republicans. Conservatives dug in against further reforms, while militant progressives within the party thought Roosevelt and his successor had not gone far enough. Reconciling these conflicting forces was a daunting task, and, and for Taft, it spelled disaster. Uh, through various incidents, he found himself on the opposite side of progressive Republicans, uh, who began to call themselves the insurgents. Uh, and they plotted their own path. Now, after completing a year-long safari in Africa, Roosevelt yearned to re-enter politi the political fray. Taft's dispute with the insur insurgents gave him the cause he needed. Uh, in a speech in Kansas in August of 1910, Roosevelt made the case for what he called a new nationalism. Early in 1912, Roosevelt announced himself as a Republican candidate for president sweeping insurgents into his camp. A bitter battle within the party ensued. Roosevelt won the states that held primary elections, but Taft controlled the party caucuses elsewhere. Dominated by regulars, the Republican convention chose Taft. Roosevelt led his followers in what became known as the Progressive Party, offering his new nationalism directly to the people. Roosevelt was not the only rebel, though, on the ballot of 1912. Uh, the major parties also faced challenges from charismatic socialist Eugene V. Debs. In the 1890s, Debs had founded the American Railway Union, a broad-based union that included both skilled and unskilled workers. In 1894, amid the upheavals of depression and popular protest, the ARU had boycotted luxury Pullman sleeping cars in support of a strike by workers at the Pullman Company. Railroad managers claiming that the strike obstructed the U.S. mail persuaded the Cleveland administration to intervene against the Union. The strike failed. Uh, along with other ARU leaders, Debs served time in prison. The experience radicalized him, uh, and in 1901 he launched the Socialist Party of America. Debs translated socialism into an American idiom, emphasizing the democratic process as a means to defeat capitalism. By the early 1910s, the party had secured a minor but persistent role in politics. Among their new generation of leaders uh, was Virginia-born Woodrow Wilson, a political scientist who had served as president of Princeton University. Uh, also as governor of New Jersey, uh, Wilson had compiled an impressive reform record, uh, including passage of a direct primary, workers' compensation, and utility reg regulation. In 1912, he won the Democratic presidential nomination. With four candidates in the field then, uh, the 1912 campaign generated intense excitement, but the former division of, of uh, I'm sorry, the division of former Republicans between Taft and Roosevelt may, made the results fairly easy to predict. Wilson won, uh, though he received only 42% of the popular vote, and almost certainly would have lost if Roosevelt had not been in the race. With his warnings about free enterprise, and his markedly southern racial views, Wilson appeared to be a rather old-fashioned choice. 
But with labor protests reaching new peaks of visibility and middle class progressives gathering public support, Wilson faced intense pressure to act. So let's talk about Wilson. That's our next sec section, Wilson and the New Freedom. Wilson was a Democrat, and labor interests and farmers made up important components of his party's base. Thus, uh, though the Greenback Labor and People's Parties had faded away, agrarian Democrats played a central role in the, in the reforms achieved under Wilson. In an era of rising corporate power, such Democrats had come to believe that workers needed stronger government to intervene on their behalf. Democrats continued to have an enormous blind spot, though, and that was their opposition to African American rights, a position to which the National Party adhered until 1948, and to which Southern Democrats clung even longer. There was no hope, for example, that Democrats would pass federal anti-lynching legislation. But Republicans, who had plentiful opportunities, had also conspicuously failed to pass such a law. Uh, in 1912, the Progressive Party had refused to seat Southern black delegates uh, and failed to take a stand for racial equality. African Americans had no reason to vote for Democrats, but they found few reasons to vote for Republicans or Progressives either. Uh, the new president also reorganized the nation's financial system uh, to address problems caused by the absence of a central bank. The main function of central banks at the time was to back up commercial banks in case they could not meet their obligations. In the United States, the great private banks of New York assumed this role. Um, if they weakened, the entire system could collapse. This nearly happened in 1907 when the Knickerbocker Trust Company failed uh, and caused a financial panic. The Federal Reserve Act, then, of 1913, gave the nation a banking system more resistant to financial panic. It created 12 district reserve banks funded and controlled by their member banks with a central Federal Reserve Board to impose public regulation. Wilson and the Democratic Congress turned next to the trusts. Wilson relied heavily on Louis D. Brandes, uh, the celebrated people's lawyer, uh, he believed vigorous competition in a free market was most efficient. The trick was to prevent trusts from unfairly using their power to curb such competition. In the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914, which amended the Sherman Act, the definition of illegal practices was left flexible, subject to the test of whether an action substantially lessened competition or tended to create a monopoly. A new Federal Trade Commission received broad powers to decide what was fair, uh, investigating companies and issuing cease and desist orders against anti-competitive practices. So let's, let's now look at progressive legacies and talk about, uh, I guess, the ultimate effects of, pro of the progressive era. In the post-Civil War era, millions of Americans understood that the political system needed to adjust to new industrial conditions. In the 1880s, agrarians and radical labor advocates proposed sweeping limitations on industrial capitalism. Though they exerted substantial political pressure, especially within the Democratic Party after 1896, only a portion of their vision was fulfilled. By the turn of the century, economic reform gained increasing support from middle class and elite progressives, uh, especially in the cities. They tended to propose more modest measures, again, uh, often shying away from democratic solutions in favor of expert commissions and political management by the best men, but they held substantial clout. Whether they were rural, working class, or middle class, reformers faced fierce opposition from powerful business interests. If at last reformers managed to win a key regulatory law, they often found it struck down by hostile courts. Thus, the progressive era in the United States should be understood partly by its limitations. Uh, radical prejudice and increasing elitism warped the cause of reform. African Americans, uh, their plight ignored by many white reformers, faced segregation and violence. Uh, and along with some immigrants and poor whites, they found themselves dis disfranchised. Meanwhile, federal courts slowed down the progress of key reforms like state protect protection for labor. Uh, divided power in a federalist system blocked the passage of uniform national laws on such key issues as child labor, 
urgently needed social welfare programs, including national health insur insurance and old age pensions, which became popular in Europe during these decades, scarcely made it onto the American agenda until the New Deal of, of the 1930s. Another limitation to progressive reform was the fact that business interests in the United States were exceptionally successful, uh, and they were powerful, flush with recent expansion. During the age of industrialization, voters in countries with older, more native-born populations supported more robust government re regulation and social welfare, uh, social welfare spending than voters in younger countries, like ours, populated with many immigrants. Younger voters seemed logically to be less concerned, concerned about health insurance and security in old age. Divisions within the American working class also played a key role in limiting progressive reforms. Native-born whites, blacks, and immigrants often viewed one another as enemies or strangers rather than members of a unified class with common interests. This helps explain why the Socialist Party drew at its peak less than 6% of the U.S. vote at a time when its counterparts in Finland, Germany, and France drew 40% or more. Lack of pressure from strong, self-conscious, working men's parties led to more limited results in the United States. But it would be wrong to under underestimate the achievements of agrarian labor and urban progressive reformers. Over the course of several decades, they persuaded more and more comfortable, prosperous Americans um, that the industrial economy required stronger government regulation. Even the most cautious elite progressives recognized that the United States had entered a new era. Giant multinational corporations overshadowed small businesses with immigrants and farmers' children crowding into vast cities. Ties of kin and village melted away. Outdated political methods from the spoil system to corrupt urban machines would no longer do. Progressives created new wisdom. Uh, between 1883 and 1917, they drew the blueprints for a modern American state, one whose powers began to suit the needs of an industrial era. At the same time, a stronger, more assertive United States began to exercise new influence on the world stage. Okay, so that's it. Again, this is a long one. So, read carefully, take careful notes. At this time, go ahead and answer those review questions and continue on with your work.